Elder Greg needs no introduction. He's been a member here since 2001, and he served as an elder here for years, and we're so blessed to have him and Marietta as part of this congregation. We have church again tonight, a completely different service at 6 p.m., and you're invited to join us for a special Christmas Eve service. Can we show some love to Elder Greg Harrell? Well, praise God, everybody, and Merry Christmas. Let's turn in our Bibles to Micah chapter 5. Micah 5, one of the minor prophets. While you're doing that, I'm just going to pray over us. Well, Father, I just thank you for what this season means to us, Lord. It's amazing as we stand before you, Lord, and realize the gift that you gave us 2,000 years ago. It's beyond our comprehension, really, Lord. Father, help us to receive that gift and to walk with innocence, just like the kids that we saw in the video, Father. Father, I pray over myself and ask that you would use me to deliver your word. I pray over the people that are hearing the word, Father, and I thank you, Lord, that uh, they hear what you intend to speak through me in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to tell you a story. I actually have a word about miracles. This is a miracle message this morning. Really, you'll, you'll see it's a miracle message in so many ways. How many of y'all have uh, been to that uh, Coming King Prayer Garden down in Kerrville? Some, some of you have seen it. There it is. It's huge, and you, it's shaped like a cross with a big cross. You see at the top of the cross, that's an open cross that sits on a hill overlooking Kerrville, Texas. It's 77 feet, 7 inches tall. So you can just get a sense of the scale and scope of that prayer garden that's there. On the right-hand side of the, of the cross, that would be the east side, there's a statue. It's a statue of P Jesus washing Peter's feet from John 13. Isn't that amazing? It's a huge statue. It's, it's amazing. And then in the very center of the cross is the statue for which the garden is named, take a look at this. It's the coming king. This is Jesus when he comes back, according to the book of Revelation, Revelation 19. So a number of months ago, I had an opportunity to visit this prayer garden with Marietta and, and Lois and Teresa were with us. So just a set of circumstances caused us to be able to visit this prayer garden. We were down in Kerrville. As we're headed for the prayer garden, I'm driving, Marietta, Teresa, and Lois. So I've got me and three ladies. And I missed the turn to get to the prayer garden off the freeway. And miracle number one, nobody said anything. <laughs> Hallelujah. I have to go down the freeway a couple of miles and make a U-turn to get back to the prayer garden. And they were so gracious. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> it was awesome. Are we okay? We good? <laughs> Better check. <laughs> really, they were so gracious. It was really neat. So we finally get to the prayer garden. And we have some delays getting up there. Kind of interesting. Several things happen. Timing, timing, timing. We're delayed getting up there. And once we finally get up to the top, it's up on top of the hill, one of the members of our party is not feeling well. So we're standing somewhere between that statue and that statue. So the distance is probably at least, almost probably the width of this auditorium, maybe not quite, but we're standing between the two statues. So one of our party's not feeling well, so we gather around her, and we lay hands on her, and we begin to pray. 
Thank you, God. I mean, it's the right response. And when we're done praying, I turn around, and there's two men that are right by us watching us pray. And I turn around, and I face these guys, and they're obviously not from the United States of America, if you know what I mean. And the Lord actually reveals to me at that point, I mean, he tells me straight on, Holy Spirit, these guys are Muslims. So one of the guys walk up to me, and he says, excuse me, sir. And he points at this statue, and he says, Jesus, we know, but who is Peter? Jesus, we know, but who is Peter? And at that point, I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit gave me a download, the likes of which I have never received in my life. No, 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 I'm serious. I am serious. And I began to literally know what the Quran says about Jesus. And I walk right up to them, and I'm starting to tell them who Peter is, and I tell them about the scene that this statue is taken from, John 13, about the servant Jesus. And I tell them that this is the reason that we know that Christianity is the only true, coherent religion in the world because we are standing between this statue and the coming king. And I said... You guys don't understand that you have a God that is indeterminate, that is far off. We have a Lord God Almighty that came to earth to serve us. Amazing. And I tell them all about this. And I said, but, and I point to that statue, and then I point to the coming king. I said, he is not always going to be like that. When he comes again, he's coming like this. He's coming as king of kings, lord of lords. And he's coming to set things right once and for all. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Yeah. And they are, they are getting it. They're getting it. They're like, whoa. (laughs) And they're like, you know what? You're right. Allah, we can't, be any, we can't be sure of. But when you have a God that literally wants to come to you and to serve you, that is a game changer. There's no doubt about it. Amen? Amen. So as I was preparing for this message, I was thinking, wow. The picture of the in-between, that is, our God, Jesus, serving us in that manner. And then he's coming again as conquering king. What an amazing thing that it is. So it took me back to the situation that we celebrate today, Christmas Day. We're celebrating something that, again, is miraculous. It's miraculous. And it is also one of the reasons that we know that Christianity is the only coherent religion in the world. You see, God knew that he had a sin problem and that he had to deal with it. And he started to deal with it 2,000 years ago when he sent Jesus into the world. So let's look at the passage in Micah 5.2. If you found it there. And I can't do any better of a job of telling the Christmas story than the kids just did. But I'm I'm gonna go a little bit before that. Now think about this. This passage was written 700 years before the event that is taking place. 700 years. Can you imagine? And look, and, and, and this prophecy that's contained in this passage 
is one that Jesus fulfilled, one of what some scholars say, probably 545 prophetic passages in the Hebrew scriptures that Jesus fulfilled. This is one of them that is so specific, we can't get away from it. But you, Bethlehem of Ratha, though you are little, everyone say little, yeah. little, among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth are from old, from everlasting. That last phrase is obviously Jesus, the Messiah. He is the one that whose going forth are from of old, from everlasting. Amazing. And I want to back up and look at this term, Bethlehem of Ratha. Bethlehem, pretty much, if you've been around the church for any time at all, you know that Bethlehem means house of bread. But in Hebrew, there are a lot of words that have a double meaning. So the double meaning to Bethlehem also means house of battle. Is that amazing? House of war, house of battle. And it was here in Bethlehem that the Lord God Almighty launched his war to reclaim and to restore the earth the way he created it to be. To be able to relate to each and every one of us in a way that he wants to relate to us personally. This was an act of war when Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Is that amazing? An act of war. Ephrathah, it means fruitful in Hebrew, so we get it. That's awesome, fruitful. But it also means, if you can believe this, worthless. Isn't that something? So when I read this passage out of Micah 5.2, what it causes me to think of is really the contrast that exists between the Most High God, King of glory, literally allowing himself to be born into a situation that is into poverty, into humility, creator God, who becomes humble, even to the point of being a baby, in order to save the world that he created. Is that amazing? To me, that's another point of miracle. It's a miracle, the way that God is able to order these things out. I got to thinking a little bit, and I thought that, would it be possible for us to know what it must have been like on that day when Jesus, the Savior, decided to inhabit the womb of Mary? What must that have been like? We can know a little bit about it. It's not clearly spelled out to us in regards to what it must have been like in the throne room of heaven, but we know some things that we can infer. It happened, according to Galatians 4, it happened when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive the adoption of sons. So what does that fullness of time look like in the throne room of heaven? Well, here's what I think likely happened. I'm not saying that this is out of the word, but we can infer some things. And I typically do not go this direction, but <clears throat> did Jesus stand up and literally take off his crown of glory? Did he say to the Father, thank you, Father, it's time, I'll do it? And did the angels come and remove his glorious garments 
as he began to head for earth. Well, according to the Bible, and Aaron, you cited this when you opened up the worship, in 1 Peter chapter 1, you go a little bit further down from where you read, talking about salvation, it says that the angels themselves are all about the salvation of mankind. They want to look at that. They want to inquire about it. Why is that? Because they are assistants in it, because they can't participate in it, but because they're interested to see what a miraculous God will do to save his creation. In Matthew chapter 4, after Jesus is tempted by the devil, it says clearly that the angels came to minister to him. So I've got to think that what happened, and we know that in the Christmas story, what happened was angels were dispatched to the earth to tell people about what was happening on that day. Angels were dispatched to Mary to tell her about what she was going to encounter, who she was going to be. So I've got to think that angels literally escorted Jesus. What an amazing thing that must have been. I wonder if darkness came. Certainly it was a time of great concern because the mission that Jesus was given had to be accomplished. It's the only way. It's the only way that God could deal with the fallen world. So there had to be a lot of hope in the throne room of heaven as they sent Jesus on his way. Oh, brothers and sisters, wouldn't that have been amazing if we could have seen it? Man, man, Jesus, the God coming to earth. So I did a word study on Jesus and the names of Jesus, and I'm talking about Jesus, our Savior, in the entire scriptures. And I want to go through those just very quickly with you because that's another thing that paints a picture of what an amazing and a miraculous God we have. Jesus in heaven, the Savior. According to Revelation 1, he was the Almighty. But he stepped into the role in Acts 4 of Holy Child. Revelation 19, he's the King of Kings. But he became the Man of Sorrows in Isaiah 53. In Isaiah 9, he's the everlasting father. This is Jesus. And in John 1, he's the only begotten son. Amazing. In Acts 10, he's the Lord of all. And in Acts 7, the same book, he's the just one. In Isaiah 60, he's the mighty one. And in Revelation 3, he's the amen. Revelation 5, he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. And in John 1, he's the lamb of God. What an amazing thing. Miraculous. 1 Corinthians 2, Jesus is the Lord of glory. And in John 6, he became the bread of life. John 1, he's the creator. He created everything. But in Genesis 3, he's the seed of woman. Wow. 1 Timothy 1, he's the king of the ages. And in Luke 1, he's the horn of salvation. In Revelation 1 again, he's the first and the last. And in that very same passage, he's the first begotten. Revelation 15, he's the king of the saints. And in Luke 9, he's the Christ of God. In Isaiah 40, he's the glory of the Lord. And in 1 John 2, 
He's our advocate. The glory of the Lord became our advocate. In Revelation 22, he's the morning star. And in Hebrews 1, he's the heir of all things. In Psalm 118, he's the cornerstone. And in John 10, he's the door. In Isaiah 9, he's mighty God. And in Matthew 12, he's beloved son. In Zechariah 9, he's simply king. In Isaiah 7, he's Emmanuel, God with us. In Isaiah 26, he, talking about the son, is Jehovah. And of course, in Matthew 1, he's Jesus. God saves. In Revelation 1, he's the Alpha and the Omega. And in 1 Corinthians 5, he's our Passover. Colossians 1, he's the hope of glory and what he must have been that really encapsulates it. When he stepped out of heaven, I think that that's what all of the angels that were escorting him were thinking. He is the hope of glory. And in Job 19, he's the redeemer. In Revelation 3, Jesus is the beginning of of the creation of God. And in Luke 2, he's simply referred to as the babe. Humble. Amazing. Miraculous. Isaiah 40, he is Yeshua, God. And in 1 Timothy 2, he is our mediator. In Jeremiah 23, he's the Lord of our righteousness. And in Luke 2, he's simply Savior. And in Romans 11, he's our deliverer. What an amazing God we have. What an amazing redemption plan he has for all of us. He alone was the one who could serve as the sacrifice that was required for the sin that was in the world. He alone. So he sent himself. No other religion, brothers and sisters, can deal with the problem of evil and sin in the world the way that this story deals with it. And it's a fact. I left out one name And I'll circle back around to it. One other amazing name. In John chapter 4. It opens with Jesus... His disciples are uh, baptizing, but they're baptizing more than John the Baptist's disciples are baptizing. So they decide to leave. They're going to go from Judea to Galilee. But the word is very clear. Most translations don't get this right, but the word is clear as they get up to leave, and it says that they had, had, They had to go through Samaria. This is Jesus. He's mighty God. I don't believe that he has to do anything unless he's doing it deliberately. He's working at the direction of of God. He's He's on his mission, Jesus is. He has to go through Samaria, a place that the Jews would absolutely, positively, beyond the shadow of a doubt, do whatever they had to do not to go there. And he 
sits down at the well, and you know the story. And he encounters a woman. And this woman has got so many strikes against her, she is so ashamed. She is so separated, not only from God, but she's separated from man. She's out there at a well that's far away at the, during the heat of the midday because she doesn't want to encounter anybody else. Condemnation is on her. And Jesus sits down with her and he has a conversation. Conversation is amazing. Jesus talks to her about worship and what worship will look like. And he talks to her about what her circumstances are when he has no way to know them. But he's mighty God. He's the king. He's the Lord God Almighty right there in the flesh and he's facing her. And she says to him, our ancestors believe that when Christ the Messiah comes, we'll worship in this place. Jesus responds with an amazing statement that we need to really understand the one that I've left off till now. Jesus says, and she says, Christ the Messiah, when he comes, Jesus looks at her directly and says, one you're speaking to I am now a lot of translations don't get that right either but it's simply ego Amy I am I am he's echoing what the burning bush God told Moses back in Exodus 3 shall I say sent me to redeem the Israelites and God says you tell them Ayah Asher Ayah I am that I am you tell them Ayah sent you now we don't get this we don't have a full understanding of what this term I am means, but I'm going to tell you right now, the I am in this biblical term, whether it's the Hebrew or the Greek, but particularly the Hebrew, it means that I will do whatever I have to do to be in your presence, to be with you right now. It's the manifest presence of God, I am going to relate to you. I'm going to be with you here in this place right now. That's the God we have. That's the God we have. So I'm going to step down here and we're going to sing a, a song about the names of Jesus. And then I'll come back up and if, and I'll just offer an opportunity to if you want to relate to God in a way that maybe the Lord has spoken to you this morning we'll just we'll just talk about it a little bit I'll come back up after we do this song is that okay it's a special day
this message spoke to you, with your heads bowed and your eyes are closed, and you've never realized that God provided himself a sacrifice for the sin and the condemnation that maybe you have walked in. It's the first time you ever heard that, and you you want to walk in a relationship with God. He made a way. He made a way. He wants to relate to you in such an intimate way. He wants to talk to you 24-7. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. That's the way he wants to relate to you. So this is the first time that you've ever heard that and you want that relationship with the Most High God through Jesus, whom he sent. If you just raise your hand real quick. Raise your hand. There's heads are bowed. Everybody's eyes are closed. Wonderful thing. Father, we just thank you for your miracle. The miracle of this season that we celebrate. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you that you are a God of relationship and that you made a way for us to relate to you, Lord. Thank you for blessing us, Lord, giving us Emmanuel. Thank you for leaving heaven and becoming the babe. Thank you for these people that are gathered here, Lord. And as they go out to celebrate the birth of Christ, I just ask that you bless them, each and every one, that you keep them, Lord. And that they be filled with your joy and your Holy Spirit as they leave this place. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you, church.